Welcome to our meditation for this, the Monday in Holy Week. We finished our services yesterday, kneeling in silence, uh, as if we were moving into a vigil for the whole week. And so our worship will be uh, coming to you from within the church this week. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, and there they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The word of the Lord. On this Monday in Holy Week, we hear again the story of this very, very strange dinner party, this dinner party that foreshadows what is to happen in the rest of the week. Confusion, disarray, gathering around a table, betrayal, and ultimately death. You know the story. They're gathered at Mary and Martha's house in Bethany to celebrate the raising of Lazarus. Jesus is there. Some of the disciples are there. Judas is there. Mary and Martha are there. And instead of banter, instead of conversation, instead of toasts, instead of joy, we have Mary producing this costly perfume and anointing Jesus' feet, wiping it with her hair. An extraordinary uh, act, which John portrays as an extraordinary act of grace of Mary anointing Jesus for his burial, which was looming in the distance. Now, we know the story already. We know what is going to happen at the end, and so Mary's act might not seem quite so extraordinary to us. But in the midst of a dinner party, a celebration, it's a very strange, foreboding thing that she does. And then the other main character in the story remonstrates against it, Judas, complains. Judas says, this money should have been spent for the poor. John is quick to blame Jesus, to blame Judas. John wants Judas, wants us all to know that Judas is a thief. Judas is a rotten person. Judas is the scum of the earth. Judas is going to be a betrayer, and Judas deserves whatever is coming to him. So he contrasts, he's contrasting the grace of Mary with the depravity of Judas. When I'm, as an aside, when my first boss quoted Jesus saying that you will always have the poor with you, he liked to point out that it was an observation and not a commandment. Well, apparently the party kept going, and as people began to hear that Jesus and Lazarus were there in Bethany, the crowds gathered, many of them there to see Jesus, many of them there to see Lazarus. And the chief priests, were told, who were already planning to bring about Jesus' death, decided they might as well kill Lazarus as well, because he was getting so much attention to Jesus. 
It's just an, a, a piling on of dreadfulness. But let's stay a moment and see if there's a way to look afresh at what's happening with Mary and what's happening with Judas, because their acts are not actually quite so obvious as familiarity with this story brings, it, brings about. How did Mary know that Jesus was going to die? Six days out, was it clear? Certainly he'd predicted his passion. Certainly there was a sense of inevitability that he was heading to his death in Jerusalem, or at least some kind of showdown. Uh, but she chose, to, in, in the middle of the party, to anoint him for burial. Would everyone have known what was going on? Maybe, but maybe not. Certainly, Judas didn't quite get what was happening. Certainly, Judas didn't quite understand what it was that Jesus was about. He was still about bringing about change. He was still looking for a powerful Messiah who was going to kick the Romans out. He was uh, a manager, in a sense. Um, and John accuses him of being a thief, and maybe he was. But maybe we can find something of ourselves in Judas. Maybe we can find something of ourselves, uh, which we seem to do quite easily with Mary, but maybe we can find something of ourselves in this, in this man who, who is trying to do the right thing, best he can, without really understanding what it is that Jesus is about. He doesn't know the end of the story like we do. And I can imagine really still wanting a Messiah who was going to take care of the Romans and put things to rights. Can we perhaps not see something of ourselves in both Mary and Judas? It's disorienting when we do that, instead of running away from Judas and running towards Mary. It's disorienting to begin to see who we are in the midst of this holy, holy week. I pray that the days to come will bring each of us some new appreciation of a familiar story so that out of our own confusion, out of our own awareness of our own sinfulness, we might discover great joy at Easter. I'd like to offer as a prayer the words of the anthem we are about to hear, words during which you will see images of this story of this extraordinary dinner party. The words of our anthem. I groan as a guilty one, and my face blushes with guilt. Spare the supplicant, O God. You who absolved Mary Magdalene and heard the prayer of the thief have given me hope as well. My prayers are not worthy, but show mercy, O benevolent one, lest I burn forever in fire. Grant me a place among the sheep and separate me from the goats, placing me on your right hand. We continue in prayer. Almighty God, whose beloved Son willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption, grant us courage to take up our cross and follow him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, who created us in your image, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations, to the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord.